Uh, my name is Adam Rosine. I work for a company called CrowdStrike. We do um, fancy security stuff to protect your computers from the bad guys. We use a lot of Scala in the, in the cloud. Um, but I'm mainly going to, well, I'm going to talk about something that I wasn't quite sure if was going to be kind of a tutorial or a, uh, is it just a, a, a a lesson, an education, or is this is this kind of be about um, how we write code and can we read it and how do we write more readable code? But aren't the types supposed to help us? And um, so that's kind of a little bit of background. So it's, we're going to talk about code, and, and I want to know. Um, I want to help you write better better code. I'm going to give you some ideas of what I think are better code using this construction called the OR comprehension. I find that a lot of beginners don't necessarily use it as much as they could, and it's, it's quite valuable. Um, so I'm going to start out. Um, there's this uh, funny cartoon where um, I think it, it goes, it, it's actually a quote from some Scala, uh, Scala Z uh, developers who are like, Oh, I'm, you know, this, what, what are we, amateurs? You know, what, what you know, can read? Flat map, flat map that shit. Like, but that's, you know, that's, we don't want to hit people. That's too violent. We want to be nice. Uh, you know, we want to, we want to help each other out. We don't need to, we don't need to slap each other. That's not the right attitude. Um, so, uh, who wants to answer this question? Do you, do you use more comprehension? Do you like them? Yeah. Yeah. No. You, what? Uh, what? What don't you like about them? Okay. We need a better. Yeah. Better answer. I know. I know. Uh, what don't they like? Yeah. No, I don't like them. You use them all the time. You're not. You're not a plant in the audience. Okay. So, this is a question I want everybody to ask themselves. You know, well, why? Uh, why don't you use these things? Um, so I'm going to kind of break down what this thing is really all about. Uh, it'll, it, based on some of the other talks I've seen uh, these past two days, I think it should fit in uh, with some of the topics that other people covered. So um, I'll, there's a little bit of cut off here, but I think it's going to work. If nothing's clear out, I'll tell you what it means. Um, so this is Scala. We, we have a great type system. There's all these talks about using the types, and doing type-driven type development. They're great, you know, okay. I, I don't really know what this thing is, um, but I, I know it takes an input, so that's some message, and it takes some tags, which is kind of a math thing, and it returns this uh, pair of some data and an actor ref and stuff, and a callback, okay. I might be able to figure out what that does. But uh, it, it, this is the actual implementation of that function. And you don't have to read it to really understand that it's kind of, it's, it's ugly and there's a lot of repetition in it. And there's a lot of nesting going on. And if you were to go into this code, you probably would be a little bit afraid to, to touch it. It's kind of picky. So, we want, we want our code to look more like this. Um, it's short, it's just a few lines. Uh, we can see on the right hand side there's some functions being invoked and they produce some values that are on the left hand side. And then we do something with those values on the left hand side. In the end we're just returning that thing. So this is, this is sort of what we want. We, want. we don't want that big long chunk of code that everyone just doesn't want to touch. Um, so I'm going to talk about F. What's F? Um, so you might see code that has uh, this F. So F could be something, something that you're familiar with, like a list or something like that. But it's a, it's a parameterized type. And so uh, the reason I, I'm bringing up this F, it could be named anything, but it's typically called F, uh, is that it's used in four comprehensions, hence the F. So 
um, list list sort of has that shape. It looks like an F, and uh, option looks like an F. Takes a type parameter like that. Um, this is totally cut off, but lists, options, futures, eithers, all types that you might be familiar with that you use all the time. Maybe maybe either. Maybe there's maybe there's a lot more. Uh, so I'm going to talk about four comprehensions now. Um, solution. So there's a hidden F up to the left here. We'll all imagine that just sitting there up above the slides. Um, so one way to think about a four comprehension is it's uh, code that takes an F and produces another F. So so what what might that mean? Um, so if, if if you give if you have a four comprehension with an option. At the end of it, no matter what you do inside of it, you're going to get an option out. So, so this 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 uh, this function takes an uh, option to another option, and in the the, the lower case, the same pattern emerges. We we are doing something with lists, and in the end, we get a result that's a list. So they always keep the same f. And that can cause, that can be very nice, and it can cause some difficulties when you're talking, when you're invoking other functions that maybe don't return the f that you are particularly using. And I'm going to show some examples of how to deal with that. Okay, this is going to be a little tall, but um, it's important to know that the for comprehension is actually, uh, it doesn't really run the way you see it when you write it. Uh, it actually is syntactic sugar that the compiler translates, and it helps to know what the compiler is doing uh, when you're dealing with compilation errors and when you're trying to figure out what you want your function to do. So, uh, if you look at uh, this for comprehension here, there's no uh, there's no yield statement, so we're not re we're not interested in returning anything. And if you can, if it's a little, uh, check the side screens if, if you can, if you can't read this, but. Uh, basically, I'm just invoking the, the compiler here and printing out what the AST is. So you can see that a, uh, a four with no yield turns into a four each. So you could imagine uh, that, so you have that sum, we create an option with, that's a sum, and we call the for each method on it, and then we print it out. So those are completely equivalent. Um, so, okay, that, 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 that that sort of makes that makes sense. If there's no tricks. There's no tricks involved in, in using this thing. Um, so here's another one. So this time it's exactly the same code except we're we're yielding a value. We want to return that thing. So we're pulling the the uh, value out from the option and we're adding one to it. So in this kind of a single um, single line for comprehension, that gets turned into a map, as you might expect. Think about uh, another, well, a completely equivalent way of writing this for comprehension would be uh, sum 12 map x goes to x plus 1. And then that would work fine. So no magic there. This one, OK, so now we, instead of a, a one line for comprehension, uh, I, I'm calling this a uh, a two-line or comprehension, just just for notation in a way. Um, so this is a bit more complicated. Um, so the way that this gets translated is that in, rather than in the one-line case where the statement turns into a map, the first one turns into a flat map, and then nested inside of that flat map is another map. Since this serves two, if it was x, y, z, there would be a flat map, and inside of that flat map is another flat map, and inside of that flat map is a map. So, one way to think about that is that um, from from the syntax of the for comprehension, we are defining an order in which things are happening. So, if let's say on my second line. I did something with the x from the first line. The only way that could happen is if I ran the first line first. 
and the second line second. So that implies that if you translate that into functions, that they're nested inside of each other. Does that make sense? Uh, so this is where flat map comes in. Flat map is the most important method for this, uh, for any classes that you make that you want to use in the forefront. So now it's, you might have seen something like this where, oh, there's an if. There's an if in this for comprehension. I think the syntax is very clear. It's like, well, I'm going to pull out the value from that sum. And uh, so, so just so you know, no one would write code like this. You could, in, the, in place of sum 12, that would be some variable that I don't know what's in it, but I'm just trying to explain, show it to you so you sort of know. Uh, so if, if I pull the value out and I call it x, then if x is less than 10, then only then will I yield the value, which would be 13. Um, if that predicate, if, that, if the thing in the if <coughs> returns false, then in the case of an option, it's going to return a none, and it will not invoke the x plus 1. So it acts just like um, if you desugar it, uh, the filter or with filter method is, is sort of a, a variant of it that's equivalent. So I'm just filtering out values inside of my option and then I'm doing a map. And so if the filter fails, I get a none, and the map just gets over it. Nothing, no magic there. Finally, this is the one that I find very useful, and I find that people actually don't know about it, so I, I want everyone to remember this one. Um, I'm not, you don't always have to do, use this uh, left arrow. You can actually define intermediate values inside of your for comprehension. So if you had, um, if, if you wanted to do something uh, like, rather than having a completely giant um, statement, expression inside of either on, a, on in the yield or calling out to read back or something, you can just um, literally declare a variable inside. And that's pretty cool because you can, uh, Rather than having these long, you might have a long expression. You just want to like break it up and just list it out. But since you're in the, inside of this fork comprehension, this it's very it's very small. It's very cramped. Those uh, those braces sort of lean on you. Uh, but you can you can make room with this. And the way that this works is, is really um, natural once you once you see how it, how the compiler deals with it. So the compiler needs to define a, a variable like that. But what it does is. Um, so just like before, the first line turns into uh, a map, and then the second line, the way that gets expanded is it, turn, it creates a tuple. So it just creates a pair with the x and the value of the y, and then passes that along, and then it projects um, down, you can see down here that in the end, it's gonna, we only want to return y, so it decomposes that tuple and then only returns the, the y part. So it's a pretty cool trick. Um, it's cool to know, but it, it's very useful to be able to find these intermediate structures. So if you have some four proper, basically one of the messages that I want everyone to get is if, if code is ugly, you can do something about it. And, and that, that might be one way that you have to use it. Okay, so um, I kind of have a handful of techniques around this. Um, so, so now, now we have this uh, piece of syntax for for, for the for comprehension. We kind of know we know how it works. There's there's no magic to it. The compiler does some stuff. It turns into maps and flat maps and filters. Uh, so now I'm going to try and show some bad code and, and maybe how to improve it into some better code so that you can use this you know, in your day-to-day -day coding. Uh, I, I might call them group. Maybe they're better like uh, warnings rather than rules. Break, you can break rules too. Uh, so that says avoid complexity braces. So 
A lot of times you see code where there's some function or value, there's some function, and on the first line after that equal sign, there's an open brace. And then you know you're in trouble because there's all these things in it. There's values being defined, maybe inner functions being defined, there's all sorts of uh, if elses in there. Um, this is, this is some complex stuff, and I'm, I generally will use that as a signal that this method could be rewritten in a, in a better form. So uh, I, I would call it a code smell. And, and one thing is, it, it's a bit, I'm not sure whether to start from one side or the other, but you can imagine, uh, because you have this free space that you've defined with, that you can do anything in, that's surrounded by these braces. You can, you could go call out to your a random service. You could block, you know, the thread. You can, you can do all these arbitrary side effects. And so it's a little bit of a un unrestrained, non-constrained area. And so um, four comprehensions kind of avoid this a little bit, and it makes it a bit easier to structure. So um, what's so, as I said before, four comprehensions convert these f-like things into another f-like thing. So, so in a way, what they do, are doing is more constrained. They're only dealing with the things inside of this this f, which could be a list or a future or something like that. Um, and so, if we have this magic this magic effect, this this magic f, you know, I I don't really care how it works. When I put it in the four comprehension, it becomes a lot like all the other code I see that deals with lists and options and, and, and so on. There's nothing mysterious about this magic effect that I'm that I'm dealing with. I'm I'm, I'm in a way ignoring this f, and I'm I'm really only caring about the values inside of it. You know that that's the computation I want to do. Uh, so. This can, just, just by avoiding those methods and trying to fit it into, say, a four comprehension or something that doesn't need those braces around it, uh, that can be a good uh, path to take to making your code clearer to understand and, and more well factored. Uh, so that says RHS, which stands for right hand side. Um, so I, I made the I copied this macro from the Shapeless project and, and changed it a little bit because I wanted to show what a compiler error for uh, four comprehensions might look like. Uh, so what's wrong with this uh, four comprehension here? Um, well, the first line is dealing with an option, and the second line is dealing with the list. Four comprehensions always deal with the same thing. Same shape. Okay, so that's what the so it said. Oh, I found a I found a list, but I was expecting an option. What are you going to do? You got to fix that. If you went to Lars' talk, you would know why this why the compiler is complaining. Uh, so the easiest way is to say, okay, well, I need to fix the, I need to fix this thing. So I had an option. And, Option actually has a method called to list. If the option is sum, it'll make a list. Well, you could, if you think of, a, of, a, of an option, it's really like a list that's either empty or it has one element. So naturally, it has a to list method, and you can use that. So now, the first line is a list, the second line is a list, the whole function gives me a list. So if, if the compiler is giving you a message like that, figure out how you can turn the structure that you have into the structure that you want. Okay, this thing is not named reverse, but is named traverse. Um, so I'm going to skip this because it's it's a bit uh, uh, it's better with an example. But let's say uh, let's say you have this function which works on an integer. I, I call it do work, uh, and it does some work in the background. This is a normal thing we all do it all the time. I'm 
submit a job and it's going to return a value sometime and I get a future to contain that value once it comes back. Um, and I just stuffed it out with a, with a bogus successful call. Um, then, you know, we have a function that, that takes one input and returns a future, but, but I have a, a list of those inputs. So if I just uh, iterated over the list, you know, got out each integer and called my function, which gives me the future, oh, well, that's not going to work just like how I described, how I described before. The, the, the wrong shape. There's a list, but I'm, I'm producing a future. So I don't really know how to um, convert a future into a list. They're, they're just they're not compatible. They're not, they're, not, they're not similar in any other way. A future is just a different kind of thing. So there's this nice method. Um, that's a little cut off in this code, but I, I think the important part is here. Um, there's this method on the future companion object called traverse. And what it does is what you were actually wanting to do with the for comprehension, but it won't work. So for each element of the list you pass in, it's going to invoke the do work function. And then it's going to collect, so you can imagine each element becomes a future int. And then I have a list of future ints. And then what it's going to do is this weird inside out thing. So rather than returning a list of futures, it's going to give you a future that, when completed, has the list of results. It's a magical method. <coughs> it's amazing. How does it do that? It's great. So now you can see the return type is future of list of int. So if you were creating a, a for comprehension and you had the compilation error that you, you saw just before, uh, you could turn that computation rather than uh, being trying to agree that each line is working on lists, you could use traverse, and now you can make a for comprehension that's working on futures. And the future will return the list on the left hand side. Now, in projects like Scala Z, there's there's traverse methods for lots of other Fs, and uh, but this is the one you can use for futures, which is sort of the one that I most commonly use in, in, in my code at work. It's a pretty natural path. Uh, there's another one called sequence. I don't have an example for it, but it's very similar to, to traverse. It actually is directly doing that inversion. So you might have a list of futures, and but the code you're working on needs a future list. So you can invoke a, a command, a function called sequence. So to more um, more practical matters, in a way, I see this a lot. Um, people pattern match on things like options. Um, I mean, just looking at it, I didn't know what it was doing. I don't even know what it's doing. What is it doing? Uh, it's a bit hard to read. Like, if you ever see a case none, which returns a default value, there's no real computation in the, in the other side of it, then that just says, that just screams to me, don't, don't pattern match on that. Use, use the methods on an option. They're really nice. I mean, all this code, can be just turned into something much simpler. I'm pulling a value out. I'm accessing a field inside of that value that may or may not be there. And then I'm performing some if else on it. So rather, it's much simpler. So avoid, avoiding the matches, especially on option, uh, try. Uh, almost, almost every sort of structure has uh, better methods. The only, the only caveat I would make would be if your logic uh, in, is very complicated in all the cases that the pattern match uses. Um, that might be a signal that this is a very complex thing that you're doing and maybe that should change. But if it's very asymmetrical like this, there's almost always a combinator method that will do what you want. 
fact, for trials, I have to, for instance, print uh, uh, the exception. So I, in case when I do map, or, or in your case, uh, I have to also deal somehow with exception. Um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, I'll, let's, let's bring it up at the end, because I, I think I, I might have an answer that might, might satisfy you. Okay. Why don't you use uh, get or else instead of this thing? Uh, in, this, in this code? Yeah. Um, okay, so... You're not, you're not getting so, so the return value, the, the type of the, that this function returns is, is actually an option string. So it's different than the, than the original code. The original code had that. Um, so, the way I... I guess I don't have any particular rule about it, but sort of in my experience, the default value is almost never important to the function itself, but is more important to the caller. So if, if the caller was, uh, you know, the, the, the piece of code that's invoking this function is better suited to determine what the default value would be. Um, if you really wanted to change the signature to, to do that default, you would you would have to make the code slightly ugly. And I don't have a good solution for this. You basically have to wrap this for comprehension in parentheses, and then invoke the get or else method with the default value on it. So I kind of see that as a, as, a, as a bit of a smell, or it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a signal, like default values, and, and towards what you said, like oh I I want to log this exception. Where do I log it? Do I log it in the function that, that catches it from the library that I'm using? Uh, and, but I'm going to suggest you, you pass it up to the caller. That usually the caller is the one who determines the de default values. Usually the caller is the one who uh, is going to be the one who is going to log this thing, rather than the important logic of your function that's just doing the computation. I'd like to see those parts um, separated. Uh, this one is really hard to read, but it's kind of the point. There's, there's a bunch of these intermediate values. I tend to, I go back and forth over the years, but you know, there's a lot of advice. Oh, if you have a complex expression, factor out different parts into 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 values, so it's easier to understand. But but sometimes. Um, Especially if you notice any of the methods that for comprehensions desugar into. So if you see some maps inside of your uh, intermediate values, if you see some flat maps being invoked, um, that's a sign that you could instead put those intermediate values inside of your for comprehension itself. Um, so it might be able to turn into something like this, where uh, the first line is, is where we're pulling a, a value out and then we're computing some intermediate results, uh, whatever it is. And, uh, and finally, we're, 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 we're done with those. We're using those um, other results to compute the value that we want to return. I find uh, there's, a little bit, there's a little bit less noise, too. It's just sort of visually there. There's not these, what's nice is you don't have to say val everywhere. And kind of vowels are. Uh, a bit of a, of a signal themselves that, that maybe they can be passed along and uh, this might be useful. So the, I'm, I'm reaching the end, but I'm going to sort of offer up a little bit of, a, of an experiment for here. Like, um, so what if we, we, we've been seeing these functions that act on options and futures and lists and sort of the usual subject, uh, usual, usual suspects. So, you know, we've been seeing functions that are for comprehensions that look like, look like this. Oh, I'm doing something with an option. Oh, I'm doing something with the lists. I'm adding one to everything in it. The previous one, I'm adding one to the thing in the option. I'm adding one to everything in the list. I'm adding one to the thing that I get from the future, 
you know, we wouldn't actually view the future successful, but there would be some function which would turn the future. You know, we're just adding one. So maybe we can separate these things. So this is the very fancy way of doing it. So now we're back to the F. So I want to say for for all Fs uh, with a with a caveat that I'll explain. Um, I have a function which takes an f of int, and since we're going to implement it with a for comprehension, we get an f out. So we get a, it happens to be an integer because we're going to add one. So so the code is really is just the same as everything else. Uh, I passed in an f. I just don't know if it was an option or a list or whatever it was, uh, and I'm adding one. So uh, so then I have some examples. So I can use the same function to add one to the option kind. Uh, you know, I get I get a two, a list. You get two, three, four, etc. Uh, now, if, if you uh, if you attended large talk, you know that a functor is something which has a map method, and because four comprehensions use map in the case where there's one expression in them, uh, you can see how this works. So if there's a if my f has a has a map method, then that four comprehension will work. Ta -da! Now, but this is also kind of doing too much in a way. Like, I don't, I don't care if I am using an, any f. All I care about is adding one to my number. You know, you can imagine adding one to some complex mathematics or or some uh, some interpolation or, or something. You know, something more complicated. But I'm really just taking an int and producing an int. Why, why do I have to write anything that deals with f's in the abstract or or particular f's like lists and options? Why do I have to write functions that need to know about these things? So really, we just want a function that takes ints to ints. You know, it takes uh, whatever it gets. It's going to add one and. If we need it in the context of a particular f, we can do what's called lifting. So you can imagine the lower level of pure computations just takes ints to ints. And we want to lift it up to an f of int going to an f of int. So in, in uh, Scala Z, there's a, there's a function to do that. If you get the, the functor for that f, in this case I'm demonstrating an option, uh, so my, my first function is int int, and now I have, if I call the method lift on my function, now I have a function that is, where's my type? Uh, option int to option int. If you got the functor for list and you lifted that, then you would now have a function that takes a list of ints to another list of ints. Um, this isn't necessarily useful in everyday coding. But if you're dealing with, if you're creating a library, for example, you can separate the pure computations from ints to ints, from your value classes to other value classes. They don't have to be the same type. Could, I could have a function that takes ints to magical fairy dust. And now I can lift it into, oh, a list of ints. And now I get a list of magical fairy dust. Um, so you can separate these things uh, if you so choose. So if you s one uh, one way you you could all alternatively interpret this is if you see that you're defining methods where you're passing in option and then you're unwrapping it and wrapping it back up, and wrapping unwrapping it and wrapping it back up, you could probably just write the function in terms of the type that the option is holding and then lift the whole computation up to deal with optional values afterwards. You don't have to mix them together. Sometimes those containers, those Fs, uh, are just getting in the way. And you want to be working at a more pure, referentially transparent uh, way. So to summarize, um, four comprehensions I would say, are just a really good signal that your code is well factored. So if you can take your code 
and reduce it down into a more comprehension, that means that you're not using so many intermediate variables, or those intermediate variables are much more um, aligned with the structure of the computations going on. It means that if you're performing computations, you have factored them out into, into functions so that the left-hand side of that arrow and the right-hand side of that arrow are just short strings that are not very complicated. Um, if you know how the four comprehension is, is desugared, it, I think it makes a lot more sense. That, uh, I should make like a cheat sheet so you just go, oh yeah, I know what that does. Actually, if you see, I'll share the slides and uh, you can see the call that I make to the, um, in the REPL and you can run any expression, any four expression that you want in the REPL and it'll show you how it gets desugared. It's, 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 it's completely easy to do. Um, and if something doesn't make sense, they can say, oh, I see why it doesn't make sense. I have a, it, I'm trying to flat map over a list, but I'm not a list, something like that. Um, avoid, avoid these complexity braces. It, if you're, sometimes if you have a more constrained environment, like these four comprehensions that need things that map and flat map and filter, uh, it can make things cleaner and clearer in your code. If you have too much space to do, it's like a, you know, the, a kid in a candy store. You're just going to cause a lot of trouble if you give yourself a little too much freedom. It's it's a it's sort of a, it's, I, I call this a code smell. So it's it, it may be necessary, but it, it's a it's a signal that you can use that maybe this piece of code is too complex. Uh, use the inline values is a trick that I find that people don't know, but they can make the code nice and and. Please uh, believe that you can make, if you see some ugly code, you can do something about it. Not only can you improve the type signature, which is always a good idea, but you can take these nested structures and turn them into something a lot clearer. That's all I have, and thank you. So I might as well comment a little bit. Um, so, so you were saying, uh, if, if I'm pattern matching, the, a normal thing would be to pattern match on a try. Um, and in, uh, so a try is either a success, which returns a value you're interested in, or it's a failure, which is an, has an exception. Um, if I was, uh, if I had a, so the most common situation I've found for using a try would be to, uh, I'm calling some library, like Java code that might throw an exception. So I wrap that in a try so that it automatically basically it automatically wraps it in a try and if there's an exception, it has the value failure. Now I'm interested in, in the value of that of, of the success case much more often than I'm interested in the failure. So what I normally do is um, I might map over that try, to, which gives you the success case. So it'll, 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 I'll do my computation on the value that I got from the library. And then I'll return it to the caller. So the, the caller is going to get a try. And they're the ones who might be, might be interested in doing a pattern match to get the failure case. Um, ah, so you propose to deal with exception and log it, for instance? Uh, I make it someone else's problem, yeah. Just like like a, like how I kind of described the default value. Usually, your your code, if it, if it's going to produce an optional value, it doesn't know the context under which it was called necessarily. So you want to give that responsibility of supplying the default value to the caller. More often than not, it's sort of a, a, a subject, sort of a rule, I would say. I'm sorry, I think we'll get popped off mic so I can hear you. All right. So, uh, so if you have try and you want to do a hook into the error case, you can just use the other error. If it does have an error, just have a success and an error. Uh, I don't remember right. But then you can hook into the error case and then throw the try up so you don't have to unpack it. Right, so the, there's um, there's all sorts of methods on, on classes like try that allow you to 
handled with various cases. So there might be um, a method, uh, a different method than the one you mentioned would be like recover. So that would take a function that would take the, the exception and um, be able to produce a, a, a value to use uh, in this, to turn that failure into success. So, so um, you don't necessarily have to pattern match on, the, on, on like a try that you're getting back. Getting back. You can instead call these, these uh, combinator methods that the class themselves add. They usually cover all the cases. The most common, the most generic version of that is called fold usually. So um, just like you can fold a list and sort of walk through it and say add all the numbers together, um, if, you, if you fold an option, you'll be given both, uh, well, that's not true. Um, if you fold a try, for example, or, a, or an either, you'll be given the opportunity to pass a function for both values that it might take on, the success case and the failure case. Um, so that there, there are, there's always a, a way to, to handle that case, those cases without a pattern match. If your logic is quite complicated, then a pattern match is more appropriate. I would not use fold in most cases because it's more complex, it's less concise. You should use the error of the success methods combinator. Yeah, I think so. I would recommend using those methods rather than the pattern match. It's a little too general. Yep. Any other question? I guess we could. Thank you.